And the next one is from Chao Peng Shen from Penn State University. Careful. Hi, everyone. Uh, really pleasure to be here. Uh, almost uh, not very familiar with this community, but I hope that I we got to see you more and more often. So my name is Chapman Shen. Uh, I'm a faculty at Penn State University in Civil and Environmental Engineering. I also do service. Uh, I'm an editor of this new AGU journal on machine learning and computation. So please submit any papers there. Um, so I, in this talk, I will cover what is called a differentiable modeling and is about absorbing the good genes of AI into domains. And I will talk about why I think that the differentiable modeling is very transformative and you know, some uh, applications of it in global and national scale hydrology. So first of all, uh, about uh, le machine learning has been used over many uh, like seven, seven, seven to eight years in hydrology now. Uh, these are often called the purely data-driven machine learning. That's the first, I call the first phase of hydrology, uh, machine learning in hydrology. And in this case, in these applications, typically you see that you have atmospheric forcing such as precipitation, rainfall. I hear a little echo, <laughs> I've been wondering myself. Uh, a precipitation, temperature, uh, et cetera, et cetera, that get fed into, uh, and, and also attributes like slope and land, uh, land cover and soil texture that feeds into something like long short term memory, LSTM. And the LSTM outputs something else that gets compared with, uh, with observations and gets its meaning, such as soil moisture, stream flow, water quality, right? Uh, so there's, there's no process involved here. And if, amazingly, it did, did a fantastic job. This is a paper in 2017 that my uh, previous uh, PhD student, Dr. Kwai Fan, we worked on this together. The first version of this code was written in uh, Lua and Torch, uh, in Lua language. Uh, so you see that the, the, the red circles here are represent the SMAP satellite soil moisture. And we trained an LSTM model, uh, that is the green curve here, to mimic basically the responses of soil moisture to uh, uh, rainfall and uh, atmospheric forcings. You see that this is a top performing pixel and the blue line in the test year go through those red dots almost exactly very well. Uh, this is a medium performing pixel. You see that it's capturing most of that variation but missing some of the peaks. For the background, the pink line here in the back is a, is a traditional model called NOAA. But that doesn't mean that NOAA is bad actually. The, the, the story goes more complex than that you know, the, because of the limitation of the satellite data itself. And over the continental United States, we got a correlation of higher than 0.9. And it wasn't doing very well in the Northeast. I'm glad it didn't because it was not supposed to, because the noise is very large there. Um, you know, then that's when uh, other, peop uh, other folks in the community come along and did the uh, rainfall runoff modeling. And you see this picture a lot. This is the CDF, the cumulative density function of the Nash Stockley efficiency coefficient. And basically on this curve, on, on this uh, figure, a curve toward the right is a better curve. Um, the, the black line represents a traditional SAXMA model that is used in, pract uh, in practice for, for flood forecasting. It got a median NSC of about 0.64. When you switch to LSTM, it becomes 0.74. That led to some people saying, this is a step change in our predictability, predict power. And that, that is indeed very uh, you know, powerful and it's very refreshing at the time. Uh, so we also propose to impose what is called a data integration. What it's actually a really simple thing to do. You provide the most recent observations as an input to a neural network. You throw some kernels, you, if you might. Um, then it decides how to assimilate that information to improve its internal states so that it can make better forecasts for tomorrow. And typically this was done using something like ensemble common filtering, but it's complicated. But in your network, this is almost effortless. And by doing that, you get an NSC uh, at daily scale of 0.86. So these, uh, these LSTM papers can also be applied in water quality, such as dissolved oxygen, stream temperature, nitrate, phosphorus, sediment, you name it. Now, in last year, 2023, I did a little search. There were at least a thousand paper in hydrology and LSTM. So it's becoming like very mainstream now. However, we feel, still feel like something is missing. There are significant limitations with purely data-driven machine learning. 
First of all, it's not interpretable in the sense that you train the mapping relationship from X to Y directly, and there is no physical concepts in between. You cannot, because it might have lumped 20 different processes, you cannot understand what, what the neural network learned, right? Um, secondly, it could give you the right results for the wrong reason. What I mean by that is it doesn't have the right sensitivity. Uh, it doesn't know what to do with the inputs, right? Uh, and for unseen cases or data sparse regions, it might give you the wrong predictions. Uh, and, and very annoying to us uh, scientists is that it cannot logically answer very specific questions. You know, there's an interpretable AI, but they only allow you to answer a specific set of questions, like, like you know, defined style, you know, defined style. And the big problem is that is, is the thing that, that you learn an overall mapping relationship and you don't have any intermediate steps. So this led us to, uh, into the second phase of uh, deep learning, which is called physics-informed machine learning. And uh, in particular, this, uh, this paper called differentiable parameter learning. And the framework is laid out here. So we, what we attempt to achieve is to calibrate one hydrologic model over all the continental, uh, over the soil moisture over the entire continental United States. Okay, so the, the framework is laid out here. So we have some attribute, static attributes such as uh, such as, uh, you know, soil texture, slope, et cetera, et cetera. We want to know what is the mapping relationship that goes from these attributes to some physically meaningful parameters, okay? This could be infiltrating capacity, some, uh, some other parameters in the VIC model, and we do not have ground truth for those parameters. I would argue if you calibrate your model, you get some parameters, those are not the ground truth because a very simple pro sim simple uh, uh, and dreaded issue called equal finality okay? and yeah, non-uniqueness. Uh, so, but we do not need ground truth for them. Instead, we send those parameters subsequently to a process-based model. And actually, I, I, can, uh, I do not have the time to expand fully on that, but this model need to be differentiable, what we call it. It has to support gradient calculations. As long as it does that, uh, you can, this model can output something else that get, com get compared with, with observations that gives you a loss function. And we back propagate all the way through that model, through these parameters to train that one neural network. Okay? And also we use a regionalized parameterization so one single neural network has to serve the entire domain. Okay, so this is called regionalized. So one neural network has to serve not just me, but also my neighbors. So that implicitly imposes a spatial constraint, right? It's like a one technician that knows how to fix houses for everyone. So there has to be some consistency and coherence. Whereas the, the figure on the left is the, the same parameter outputted by a traditional calibration, side-by-side -side calibration uh, evolutionary algorithm. And because Every problem is independent, they do not talk to each other. It's like you're hiring a thousand technicians, everyone going to hire and fix a house, and in the end, they do things very differently, right? It's like you have ten, a thousand KFCs, everyone gives you a different hamburger. It's like going crazy there. So, uh, so what is, so we kind of try to generate, general, generalize this into differentiable modeling, what it is. It is a seamless mixture of neural networks and process-based equations. These process-based equations are fixed, prefixed, and implemented, and, 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 and prescribed, and they serve as priors, okay? And the neural networks, I think of them as just question marks. What should be the relation at certain locations in the model? And I put them there and ask for, and I solicit answers from big data, right? So I can break the problem into different parts, and some of these parts are prescribed, and some of these parts are question marks. And then I can enable end-to-end -end training on big data. And the priors, they actually serve to constrain the scope of the learning so that this, this neural network, the role is reduced. So a AI, a huge robot, you reduce it to a sidekick. You only allow it to do certain things you allow it to do, okay? So a kind of a prototype is here. We have this neural network that outputs either static or dynamic parameters for a uh, you know, you can call it conceptual hydrologic model called HPV or on something else. And it does simulate snowfall, evapotranspiration, and base flow, soil storage, uh, quick flow, and all that. And then you combine these different separate uh, calculated discharge into, into a discharge that gets compared with discharge. And back, we back propagate all the way to train that uh, M there. So why do I say that differentiable modeling is transformative? Because you, it, you, you can adapt to big data. And what I show you here, again, is the CDF plot where the black line is the traditional uh, paradigm called uh, multi-scale parameter regionalization. And the red curve is you couple differentiable parameter learning with the conceptual model without changing its structure. 
The green line here is still the bad guy in town, LSTM, it still looks very good. Uh, still hard to surpass, but I want you to pay attention to that purple line. That purple line is our differentiable model after evolving the structure based on the guidance of big data and coupling with neural networks. You can see that it can be almost as good. In our later version, I will show you that it's as good as the LSTM, but it also maintains physical concepts. We compare the, these outputs, such as Q, uh, base flow ratio and involved transpiration with alternative estimates, such as base flow separation and mode space of ET estimates. And we think their correlations are still very good. So that means they maintain their physical meaning. In fact, we're glad to see that with more learning, the comparison with the mode CT becomes even better. Um, so that's good. Uh, Secondly, second reason of, for the transformativeness, it's, uh, the DM is very strong at extrapolation. Uh, we ran this experiments where we trained this model over six parts of the United States and, and tested on the seventh part, and this is almost twice the size of Germany. So without any training data, we test the model over there. In that very data sparse scenario, we see that the differentiable model is actually better than LSTM. This is LSTM, and this is differentiable model, data NSA 0.6. And it also, uh, the LSTM tend to type kind of a plateau in terms of projecting wetting trends, whereas the, uh, the differentiable model does not tend to do that. It tends to um, give you a higher, a better accuracy prediction of future trends, precisely because it has a physical backbone to kind of prop up the model when there's no data. Okay? And this same experiments were produced on a, another global data set. We also solved the technical barrier because some of you might say, oh, you have a simple hydrological model HPV, that's easy when you have an explicit formulation, but I have an implicit model, I have to solve matrices, right? I have to, you know, for these models, I don't know the solution, I have to iterate, I have to solve like a Newton iteration or a Picard iteration, and it's more complex than that. And I agree, that indeed is a problem, right? Because these iterative schemes can run into memory issues and computing time problems that they're very inefficient when you want to keep track of the gradients, right? Uh, Actually, I forgot to mention the way we keep track of gradients, we re-implemented the whole model onto PyTorch, okay, and you, we go with use AD to, to supply that gradients typically. But here, AD would be too expensive. So we implemented what is called a joint model. Unless you guys really want to have some calculus one-on-one -on -one fun, I'm just going to be very simple here and say that you can apply the chain rule and you apply, you split the terms, this term, one term into two, but instead of computing them, you compute these two first. Okay, so with some smart reordering of the calculations and some uh, and solving what is the Jacobian matrix, you get a calculate what is called a vector Jacobian product uh, only upon convergence of the last step. So we, on, we, come, we run this iteration until convergence and only after convergence you calculate these terms to get, um, to get the VJP. And we actually implemented what is called a different discretized and optimized version of that, which is more accurate. So the adjoint bypasses the need to keep, keep tracking gradients during the Newton iterations. That saves the, it's a great save on the memory as well as, as computational demand. Okay, uh, so after we solved that implicit scheme problem, I want to show you that um, this, this figure again. Uh, now here, a black line here represent a popular LSTM implementation in the community called Kratzer's version. And you see the, the green and, and, and orange solid lines are actually to the right of it. That means a slightly higher metric. Uh, they are state of the art, right? These two lines are state of the art. Now I want to talk about this blue line here, which is a blue dashed line, which is our joint model. So the, our joint model now is as good, exactly as good as the LSTM, but it also gives you all the physical interpretability that you want. It kind of gets split out a little bit at the bottom. It's so that's where you know we really have problems with mass balance because it respects mass balance. You have uh, you know, bias in the precipitation, and this model cannot handle it because it respects mass balance. It cannot produce that much runoff, right? So, uh, so that's not a problem with the model per se, but a, a problem with the input. And this is now, we are working on projects now that uses the differential model as a backbone for the national water model, the candidate model for the national water model. And this is a basin-based evaluation where you see, this is the national water model version 2.1. And uh, the above, uh, the, the x-axis is the NSE, normalized NSE. The top panel shows that we're pushing points from this bar to this bar. And then from this, single, this middle bar to the bar on the right, so you see that this bar overall has a higher value than the, than the national model version 2.1. 
And compared to the 1.2 version, we're pushing points, all a lot of the points to the upper left, right, left corner, which is uh, we have 89% compared to 65% here. This is the low bias, high correlation section. Okay, so this the, the DM is transformative because it's widely and generically applicable. I would argue it's very much applicable to the landscape evolutionary community. Uh, here we already apply to ecosystem modeling. As you can see, you have the neural networks that output uh, photosynthesis parameters for like VCMAX25, stomatoconductance, and it also simulates uh, net uh, photosynthesis. So we're building on top of a paper we previously published in 2023 in biogeosciences about differentiable photosynthesis modeling. Now we'll take it one step further and we try to um, train and learn the function how do vegetation acclimate to different environment. Like it's like you have one tree, you move it from the tropics to the temperate zone, its behavior is gonna change, right? So we're trying to capture how VCMAX respond to these changes in the environmental variables. And we absorbed multiple data sources along the way, including both stomato, all of these three, stomatoconductance, AN, and VCMAX25. In the end, we got a model that tested very well spatially. And it compared to the CLM 4.5, it has a negative, Point, uh, negative 19% difference in the net photosynthesis. And that means, um, you know, that the original climate model grossly overestimated net photosynthesis. That's almost as large, I mean, I'm just saying here, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I, my number may not be correct, but it's almost as large as the entire industry uh, emission. That could mean that our climate model was overestimating net photosynthesis, and that's why their model, the climate models were actually uh, undershooting the warming trends. Okay, uh, DM is also transformative because now you have access to multiple variates and you can constrain in different ways where actually we incorporate a water temperature model with the uh, model called PR, the hydrologic model called PRMS and we're using water temperature data to constrain the system, uh, uh, constrain the system. And using water temperature data, we see that we reduce the uncertainty in some of the um, low flow, the, 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 the uh, deep, deep groundwater flow and resonance time estimations. And we also, uh, we think DM is transformative because it's a generic contribution to the AI. Uh, so we also previously have a paper on, uh, you know, modeling river flow and transport in a river network with a differentiable river flow modeling model. We're building on top of that in our new work, we actually implemented uh, the river graph for the entire uh, world, actually. Uh, so this you can see is a simulation for the Mississippi River Basin. What we did is we take in what is called a physics-informed reparameterization, and we use the implicit matrix form for to 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 simu si simulate this flow process. This is called uh, that's actually much much more efficient than the typical graph neural networks in computer science. So we're trying to prepare this paper for neural IPS. So over the whole world, we compared the differentiable model with, third, with the, a lot of uh, global hydrologic models over 39 major rivers with significant human impacts. Um, and we see that uh, our model is toward the center for most of these rivers, which is the good. And it's not doing very well for some of the human managed, managed rivers. My time's up, right? I guess. Okay. All right. Yeah. So I will, I will end on this slide. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Thank you. That was that was very interesting. Um, I have a question about the, I guess the input needs for this. I'm worried I'm going to expose some ignorance here just by asking the question. So forgive me if I do. But um, the 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 part of the modeling here that's sort of physics informed, right? So you you had a, an example in there. I think that was about soil moisture, and and I think the point was that if you used an LSTM model, I might get some things wrong, but if you used an LSTM model, it was sort of agnostic to fundamental properties of the soil, like infiltration rate and things like that. But those parameters are, are also probably site specific, right? They're not fundamental physical constraints or constants in the equations. So is the, is the physics informed process a way of actually estimating those parameters based on the data and then applying them to the to the equations or are you are you doing something m different from that 
Yeah, I mean these, uh, yeah, uh, thanks for the opportunity to clarify further. So these parameters are like infiltration capacity or, you know, storage limits or, you know, or release rates. So these parameters, uh, we don't have ground truth for them. We don't supervise these parameters directly. But if you have observations for them, you can add additional supervision as, as regularization for them. But in the standard paradigm, we don't have supervision for them. Rather, we have indirect supervision. Because these, these parameters are fed into a, uh, into a process-based model, and then something else of that model gets computed and propagated to train it. So it's almost like an inversion, right? But here, I'm not inversion to estimate these parameters per se. I'm actually training a parameter generator. And that's for the entire domain. Yeah. Thank you. I, so I guess then you end up with a time series of parameter values? Um, so the param actually, so that's a good question. So you can, you can output static parameters. So that means they don't change over time, but you can also output dynamic parameters. And these dynamic parameters were meant to um, off compensate for some of the missing processes. For example, in your hydrologic model, you don't have, we don't, this simple model doesn't have vegetation process, right? It also doesn't have this deep water storage process, or, or that's described very poorly. So we allowed two parameters to vary in time. So every day you have a different parameters for them. In fact, the ones that were varied uh, were like, they, they were kind of trying to mimic, if you plot them, we have a figure. They were trying to mimic this seasonal behavior of vegetation, one of them, right? So, um, and you have to, uh, this, here's some art here. We cannot actually abuse this. If you allow all the parameters to be dynamic, it kind of reverted back to an LSTM. It's, it's no longer going to maintain that physical significance. Right? So we have to be very, um, have to be very skimpy about what parameters you're allowed to be uh, is allowed to be dynamic. Yeah, and there's some art there, you know, where you could use some additional test data or validation data to determine what that number is. Yeah. Hi. Uh, yeah, maybe just to help us get a bit more this is about, and it's not really to, to know what's good or wrong in your model. You show a curve when you said, Oh, look, it works really well for the high part of the CDF. And then we lose a little bit the, the, the lower data. And I really would like to get that a bit better, like, yeah, this part. Um, what does it mean that you say, like, and I'm not sure what NSE is, is honestly. Uh, what does it mean that the, the, you say, for mass conservation reason, the, the dot, there's something wrong in the data? Like, could okay, you explain I, that a little bit more just to get sure. a bit of the sense of? What yeah, so there are a bunch of models here. <laughs> First of all, uh, there are like three LSTM models. There are solid lines. Uh, they are all kind of toward the right of this. So the right, a, a curved tongue toward the right represents a better model, right? Um, and the, the blue dashed line represents our adjoined version of the differentiable HBV. Uh, so this model takes precipitation and temperature and outputs runoff, right? So if your precipitation is, is actually very good, uh, it can be as good as LSTM. Because LSTM as a neural network, it does not respond, it does not respect mass balance. As long as you have a signal in, it can output uh, the run, the rain, it gets trained to output the, the runoff, right? So it doesn't care if you, let's just say, instead of a uh, hundred, uh, a thousand millimeters of rainfall here, I just give, I always give it one millimeters. And everywhere in the world, the precipitation is divided by a thousand. You put it, give it the LSTM, it's not gonna feel it. It's gonna do the, it's gonna give you good results because it doesn't care, right? However, with, a, with our mass conservative model, if you do not give it enough rainfall, it cannot produce run, enough runoff, right? Because it respects mass balance. And that's what we want. We want the mass conservation. But in the regions where you're, you have systematic underestimation of precipitation, then it cannot absorb that mass. It cannot adapt to it as much as LSTM can. And that's why you see that here, the curves are to the right of this, uh, to the left of these two LSTMs. The LSTMs were doing better in those data, in those uh, regions with uh, precipitation errors. Make sense? Okay, uh, we can try, we can talk more.
really, really interesting talk. Um, to rephrase what I think you just said, effect effectively the neural net, the LSTM is doing a bias adjustment step. It could. Ha yeah. Have you thought about expo incorporating a bias adjustment step into your tra parameter into your training, and does that uh, close that gap? Yes, we did, and uh, actually I don't have a hidden slide here. <laughs> uh, in fact, we have a neural network number two to take three different sources of precipitation, and every day it learns to up output at different weights for these three sources of observation. In fact, after doing that, we find our NSE to increase uh, noticeably. So it can learn to account for some of that uh, error if you give it multiple sources of information. However, we find it not able to improve it much when you only give it one source of information, presumably uh, by, by tuning the t parameters, it already kind of adjusted to some of that. Uh, but, you know, if you have two, three sources, it learns to uh, squeeze a bit more. Out of it. Yeah. That's it. Thank you.